Tonight, a WISN 12 News Commitment 2018 election special. The U.S. Senate debate in partnership with Marquette University Law School. Democrat Tammy Baldwin and Republican Leah Vukmir meet in their final debate. Wisconsin's race is one of the most watched in the country with control of the U.S. Senate at stake. The people of Wisconsin need someone fighting for them. Tammy Baldwin, Wisconsin's junior senator, is seeking her second term. Leah Vukmir, a state senator, is making her first run at statewide office. Look what we have done here in Wisconsin and how we have turned things around. And now, live from the Marquette University Law School, here is tonight's moderator, WISN 12 News political analyst and upfront host, Mike Ushay. And good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's debate. We're live at Eckstein Hall, the Lubar Center at Marquette University Law School, where I work as a fellow in law and public policy. Tonight, we have the candidates for U.S. Senate with us, incumbent Democrat Tammy Baldwin and the Republican challenger, Leah Vukmir. This is the third and final televised debate between the candidates. Our format tonight will be simple and straightforward. We'll be having a conversation. I'll be asking the candidates about issues that are important to Wisconsin voters. I'll ask them to respond directly and concisely to those questions. And if they choose, they may speak directly to each other. But I'll be managing the time and we'll move the conversation along to make sure we can cover a wide range of topics tonight. At the end of the hour, each candidate will give a minute long closing statement. And so we'll begin with the first question going to the incumbent, Senator Baldwin. Senator, good to have you with us. And Senator Vukmir, good to Great have you to with us. Great to join you. Thank you, Mike. So uh, earlier this month at a rally in Mississippi, President Trump said, you know, I know I'm not on the ballot. I'm not on the ticket, but I am on the ticket, that this is in part a referendum on me, on Donald Trump, the president. Is it a referendum on Donald Trump? Is it a referendum uh, on President Trump? You know, I view what's on the ballot is, frankly, the concerns of Wisconsin citizens. And as I participated in this campaign, as well as my service over the last six years, uh, they've been very involved, uh, Wisconsin voters and, uh, and constituents, uh, this past two years, because they're concerned about what really is on the ballot, health care, whether we're going to cover people with pre-existing conditions or not, um, a tax plan that gave the 83% uh, of the benefits to the top 1% uh, and massive corporations rather than middle class working families. Those are the issues that they've been involved in, first as issues, and now uh, as the campaign uh, comes to its final days, uh, they're involved in these now uh, voting for candidates who have their back, who are fighting for them, and standing up to candidates who are in the pockets of the special interests. So I so don't it's think not, it's no, Trump. It's not about President I Trump. I think it's, it's not about these about. issues that affect us very intimately. Health care is personal. Yeah. Uh, getting ahead in this economy is personal, and that's what people are looking at right now. Is it a referendum on President Trump? Senator Vukmir. President Trump has been very successful in the two years that he's been in office, and what we have done in Wisconsin really mirrors what the president has done. When I think about regulatory reform, when I think about tax relief and how the economy is booming right now with a GDP that growth that nobody would have predicted, and I think about what we've been able to accomplish here in Wisconsin. Similarly, by using those principles of limited government and making sure that we recognize that people's hard-earned dollars are their do dollars, not the government's dollars, as Senator Baldwin would believe. And I think it's really important that you see the successes that we've done here in Wisconsin. People are looking for leaders who follow through on their promises, just like we have overseen an economic miracle in this state. And that's exactly what's happening at the federal level. And people want individuals who are going to follow through, do what they say they're going to do, just like we've done here in Wisconsin. You know, I, I represent the middle class. I'm a middle class mom of the cause who never thought I was going to get into politics. Not the uh, special interest that Senator Baldwin has received millions of dollars from. And that's what people want, somebody they can relate to, somebody who understands their day-to-day -day challenges. And that's what I think this election is about. Are you personally, I assume you're personally pleased that the president is going to be coming next week to campaign on your behalf? Very happy. Another one yeah. of the promises that he followed through on. He called me okay. the day after 
I won the primary and said that he would come to Wisconsin, and he's coming and he's following through, and people are very excited about it. And the former president, Barack Obama, is coming next week, my understanding is. Uh, yes. It is. And, and I assume you feel he is valuable to you here because? Uh, I feel that he is valuable because he really engaged people in this process. That. Uh, I worked with the president uh, to try to bring health care that people could afford, uh, higher quality to more and more people. And uh, he knows that I have fought to save those protections, especially those for pre-existing conditions. My amendment to allow young people to stay on their, health in, their parents' health insurance until they're 26 and other vital protections. And that my opponent would be the deciding vote to throw out the Affordable Care Act and toss really tens of millions of people off insurance. But I do want to say about President Trump's visit, you know, we should be proud when a president comes to visit. That's a big deal. And when he was, uh, when the president was in uh, Kenosha last year, he came to sign uh, a Buy America, Hire America executive order. And at that visit, he endorsed my measure to uh, allow and uh, require that our drinking water infrastructure be uh, made with American steel and iron and American workers. And just in a day or two, he's going to sign a bill, a water infrastructure bill, that has my Buy America uh, provisions in it. Um, let me, you know, let me, uh, I want to cover a lot of ground here. Yep. So, so you raised the issue of health care, and I want to get into this right off the bat I'm here. Glad. Because, well, you have profound differences on how you view health care coverage in this country. And, and uh, uh, Senator Vukmir, I'll have you address that. Um, it, it's this uh, um, narrative that you hear right now from Democrats. They say that if, the, uh, if Obamacare is repealed, uh, people will lose their coverage for pre-existing conditions. Senator McConnell says we might take another look at repealing Obamacare. Uh, come early next year, depending on the outcome of the elections. Would you be proud to cast the deciding vote if it came to that, to well, repeal Obamacare? Obamacare needs to go. But here's the interesting lie that is being perpetuated in this campaign. Senator Baldwin keeps saying that 2.4 million people are going to lose coverage for pre-existing conditions. I have said over and over again I would fall in front of a truck before I would let people go without coverage for pre-existing conditions. She knows that federal law says that if you're on Medicare, Medicaid, or an employer insurance, you're covered. If Obamacare went away today, people would still be covered. But let's talk about the remaining Not people. Not all people, Three, though. Right. Would it? We would also... Oh. You're right. Sorry. Speaking a little fast. Well, okay. um, but people then who weren't on employer-based, we took care of people with a health insurance risk sharing pool. And because we've done such a great job economically here in the state of Wisconsin, we have fewer people who are uninsured or don't have employer-based insurance. And so that means we have a smaller group of people that we would need to cover. Suffice it to say, I am committed to covering people with pre-existing conditions. But let's talk about the remaining 3.4 million people that Senator Baldwin literally is going to throw off their employer-based insurance. Her proposal for Medicare for All says that if you're on Medicare, Medicaid. If you are on the Affordable Care Act, if you are on TRICARE and on employer insurance, that will be dismantled over the course of four years. I have said this for three debates now. I'm waiting for the media to come out and say, look at this, and put a fact check Senator Baldwin on this, because it is just amazing to me that nobody is looking at her own bill. I don't even think Senator Baldwin has looked at her own bill. Section 105 to 107, Senator, it says that you will dismantle all those programs. Talk about putting people at risk. Talk about creating chaos. That's what her plan will do, and nobody, nobody in the media is talking about it. But I'm, that is the fact. I'm going to come back to this. Uh, I have another question for you on that. But Senator Baldwin, I'll have you respond to that. She says, your, your plan uh, that you have endorsed, Medicare for all, uh, single-payer, government-run health care uh, for folks in this country, would throw the system into chaos. Why is it a good idea to replace what we have now with something that is one big new enterprise. Well, first of all, I support several different measures because I think we're at a time right now that good ideas should be debated, how we pay for good ideas should be debated, and that we should have options. We had a very important vote in the United States Senate last summer. It went down by one vote when John McCain famously gave the thumbs down to repealing the Affordable Care Act and leaving so many without protections or health insurance. At that moment, 
I believe that it was possible for Democrats and Republicans to work together, and I have to always hope that it will be at the time that we stop playing politics with health care and actually get serious about moving forward. But Leah Vukmir's idea, and she would have been the deciding vote, as she just told you, is to move backwards to the bad old days. They weren't the good old days. They were the bad old days. And any uh, uh, study of... Uh, the cost of moving forward and moving towards some of the innovations that we're talking about say that the bad old days cost more, up to two trillion dollars more than moving in this uh, direction. Um, and, and I do want to just say that uh, prior to the it guarantees that people with pre-existing conditions can have coverage, many people were left in the lurch. Leah Vukmir uh, talks about her record as a nurse, but I'm more worried about her record in 16 years as a politician. She's voted with the insurance companies time over time, deny coverage for or oral chemotherapy. When Scott Walker signed it, he said this was potentially life-saving, and the examples go on. Let me. Uh, I need to respond to that. If I, I, I could. Say, and then I'm, I've got a question for you. <coughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay. Well, first of all, two things. Um, I'm glad that Senator Baldwin brought up um, how it's going to be paid for. That's my question for you. How will you pay for this 32 trillion dollar takeover of health care? We are already dealing with a debt problem. 32 trillion dollars. She has no plan for how to, to pay for it, and it's not just a conservative think tank who has come up with that figure. <coughs> also, the Urban Institute has said the exact same thing. In Canada and England, even in those countries, you can have private insurance, but Senator Baldwin would deny people the ability to purchase insurance. So that means people are going to be waiting in line, people in, in uh, emergency rooms. People wait two months in England from onset of a diagnosis to the beginning of their treatments. I can't imagine as a woman being diagnosed with breast cancer. But let's, and then waiting two months, but let's talk about this oral chemo. The very thing I was worried about happening has actually occurred. The Harvard UNC study that recently came out and said that the states that have passed similar legislation to what happened in Wisconsin, individuals who are receiving oral chemo are finding that the, the cost of their oral chemo has gone up. Senator Baldwin wants to say that, you know, I am somebody who's only concerned about insurance. I was actually skeptical of the insurance industry, and that's why I was concerned about this bill. And my concerns have been proven. It's costing those individuals more money, and it's making it harder for them to have access. All right. Well, let me jump in. Uh, yes. how, how do you pay for something that, that at least a couple of different estimates cost $32 trillion for Medicare for All? You know, I have to say, if it's going to cost more if we go backwards, there's never a debate on that. You know where those costs have been born? in bankruptcy courts. I remember hearing prior to the Affordable Care Act from a woman named Susan from Beloit. Her husband got cancer. She looked at the fine print on her insurance. It covered $13,000 of chemo. That just covered the first round. The second round, the family maxed out their credit cards. The third round, they took a home equity loan. Unfortunately, Susan's husband died, and they went bankrupt. That was the story of how we paid for it in the years before we had protections that protected people with pre-existing conditions. People will still be covered with pre-existing condition it's coverage. Just not, We're committed to it, Senator Baldwin. It's just not this true. Lie is Let it just so at, at its peak, the um, high-risk insurance program covered 1% of Wisconsinites with pre-existing conditions. There was a lifetime cap, there was a six months wait, and it was out of reach for most people. But again, Leah Vukmir seems to be more concerned with the bottom line of insurance companies than her constituents here in Wisconsin, the, the and question, that is not acceptable. The question, though, is how do we pay for it? That's, that's the question. Well, the tra transition between uh, the patchwork quilt we have now and uh, uh, Medicare for all would uh, be gradual. Um, and part of that is what is on the table for debate. But I can assure you, with this president, He's not going to be signing a Medicare for All uh, act into law any time in his term. We can be sure of that. We have time to debate this. The problem is that my opponent wants to go back to the bad old days and not move forward. I think we should all have as an aspiration in America that everybody has access to high quality, affordable health care. And I support 
a proposal to buy into Medicare at right. 55. I support having Badger Care as an alternative mm -hmm. to buy into in the uh, affordable care yeah. uh, marketplace. I believe that we should talk about innovative ideas to build us, bring us um, in this direction. My opponent simply wants to go back to the I, bad old days. I want to. I want to ask a question about. I have the, to respond. No, no, no. no I'm going to ask a question okay. here if, you, if the two of you allow me to do that. Um, <laughs> so the question is this. Um, you know, Governor Walker has also said uh, we're going to guarantee uh, coverage for pre-existing conditions. Uh, we're going to pass legislation. But the fact is, the Assembly passed legislation, but the Senate didn't. And even this week, the Senate Majority Leader, colleague of yours, Scott Fitzgerald, when he was asked about whether they had the votes to pass legislation that would cover people with pre-existing conditions, he said, I'm not sure. Then he changed That's his mind. That's why they need to elect me to go. Then, That's then, why you need to elect me to go. Then he changed his mind. But, but I guess the question is, if I'm a person with a pre-existing condition and I'm hearing that kind of wavering, uh, shouldn't I be somewhat apprehensive about what could come down the road? First of all, I've said it before and I'll say it again. If Obamacare goes away today, federal law says that if you're on Medicare, Medicaid, and employer insurance, you're covered for pre-existing conditions and we will cover the rest. Senator Bowen wants to talk about going backwards. Going backwards is telling seniors that you no longer have your Medicare and your Medicare Advantage. I can't believe that Senator Baldwin wants to literally throw grandma off the cliff. That's exactly what she's doing. This would create a chaos of epic proportions. She doesn't even understand her own bill. Look, I believe that we need to bring power back to the states. Where in Wisconsin, we knew what we were doing before Obamacare came in, and it was a one-size-fits-all. Would, would you concede there were fewer people covered <coughs> and they paid more in the risk pool than there are? Under Obamacare. I think there will be fewer people in a risk pool because our economy is churning, because we have more people who are going back to work, and we are committed to taking care of those who aren't currently covered. I want to know why no one is talking about the 3.4 million people that will be thrown off of their insurance. <laughs> Everyone keeps fixating on the lie that Senator Baldwin and others are perpetuating, but what about those individuals who will no longer have their insurance? I've done an ad, it's been out this week. Teresa, a woman with a very rare lung disease, and she is frightened over the fact that she may not have the doctor, the specialist, the lung care specialist, who only knows how to care for her rare disease. But apparently that doesn't matter to Senator Baldwin. We're, we're going to wrap this up quickly. I give yes. you 15 seconds and then we're going to move on to the next topic. Yes, well, Leah Vukmir supports a lawsuit that would gut protections for pre-existing conditions. She supports re repealing the Affordable Care Act. So do you. And she supports... It's in your bill. Uh, <laughs> Please. <laughs> and uh, she supports the President's uh, and the Administration's attempts to unravel the protections we have. We cannot go backwards. We must go forward. Eight years ago, we sat in this room in a U.S. Senate debate, and one of the things that was talked about at length was the federal deficit. So this week, we, we hear that the federal deficit is now at $779 billion for the last year. The national debt, the total amount of debt owed by this government is nearly $22 trillion. Um, why aren't Republicans and Democrats talking about this as an issue. Why, why is this not a priority? Why is this not a discussion we're having as we move closer and closer to trillion dollar deficits again? It's a priority to me, that's for sure. Look, I got into politics out of circumstance, not ambition. I'm a, a middle class mom. I know what families go through. I know how they sit around their table and they live within their means. And they expect people in Madison and Washington to do the exact same thing. We've been balancing our budgets in Madison, but they haven't been doing it in Washington. And that's why we need people who are willing to go in and do the heavy lifting. That greater than $20 trillion debt is just absolutely unsustainable, and we cannot continue passing that on to future generations. We have to, first and foremost, have a balanced budget amendment. That is probably the simplest thing that we can do. We need to then restore more power back to the states through the principle of federalism. There is such a duplication of services at the federal level and at the state level. Let's bring that money back to the states. And then let's restore spending caps. The last budget that Senator Baldwin voted for, the $1.3 trillion budget, had $138 billion blowing of the spending caps, blew right through them. That is not responsible. Senator Baldwin 
has a spending problem. Government has a spending problem. Okay. And she's willing to continue to spend. I'm not. I want to live within our means. I want to come back to this. Thanks. Why is it not more of a top of mind topic for you and other Democrats? You know, I, frankly, I think I've brought it up in every speech I've given this week. Uh, just this week, we learned news that there's a 17% increase in the deficit. And the analysis is that it is overwhelmingly due to the tax bill that uh, passed last year and that Leah Vukmir supports because corporate revenue is down. That bill gave an 83% break to the top 1% on the individual side and multinational and major powerful corporations on the corporate side. If I had done the opposite, that that 83% was helping working people and middle class families, I would have voted for it. One company, ExxonMobil, in the first year of this tax measure is going to get a bigger tax break than every Wisconsin family and individual combined. One company. That was irresponsible. And now the proponents of it are talking about not paring back on those breaks for the powerful, but instead going after earned benefits like Social Security and Medicare in order to balance the budget. Now, to your question, I believe we need to take a balanced approach to get rid of our and whittle down our deficit. I believe some of it has to be on the spending side, and I believe some of it has to be getting rid of these uh, lavish loopholes for the powerful. You know, I work for the middle class and hard working people in the state of Wisconsin, not for the Alex of the world, the corporations that lobbied for this tax break um, and write bills for state legislators to introduce. Um, and that's who I want to work for as we lower the deficit without harming people in their lives. Senator M McConnell said this past week, the Senate Majority Leader, that uh, again, that we might have to take a look at, uh, he says, entitlement programs, Social Security, Medicare, yes. Medicaid. Uh, do you agree with him? Do we have so, to make changes to those programs? So, Senator, Senator McConnell, that's a, your version of what he said. But more importantly, he did not the say president. That? More importantly, the president has said very specifically that he does not support Social Security reform. I, I'm standing with the president on that. Senator Baldwin talks well, about the middle class. Well, then, how do we reduce class. the deficit and the debt if if we don't look at um, if, if we don't want to look at the tax cut, if we don't want to look at entitlement programs, how does that happen? So, as I said before, I started to lay it out for you. I said, first and foremost, we have to have a balanced budget amendment. Then we restore the, the spending caps. The, then what we need to do is restore federalism. That's what our founding fathers envisioned for our country. There is so much power that has been given to the federal government. We have duplications between a, a Department of Education and a Department of Public Instruction. Return the resources back to the states, maybe two-thirds, and let us be more efficient at the state level. But Senator Baldwin says that she represents the middle class. Senator Baldwin, you have forgotten the middle class. You spend more time with people in the Hamptons and in California. You've collected three million dollars from the taxpayers. You have forgotten the people back home. The, you mocked the tax cuts. You mocked the tax cuts. I've been traveling the state talking to people. That $1,500 to $2,000 is making a difference in their lives. And you make it as an either or. You have to not only look at this from the perspective of that there's a de the, the deficit. What we need to do is cut the spending. Cut the spending. And that's something that you have gonna, not been able to do. Let me give her a chance to respond to what you just said. Yes. You know, we're talking about the overall performance of the economy and this increasing deficit. Uh, the economy is not working for all people. The macro economy looks pretty good. But talk to a dairy farmer in Wisconsin, and you know we're in deep trouble. Talk to uh, a manufacturing worker who hasn't seen a wage uh, raise in years, despite the fact that their employer has just gotten a huge corporate tax break. Um, we need to make the economy in Wisconsin work for working people, middle class families. And I believe it was irresponsible to vote for a tax bill that does just the opposite. Our tax code ought to reward hard work and respect the dignity of hard work and not give so much of its benefits to the top that one corporation like ExxonMobil makes more in the first year of this tax break than 
all of us in this room and the rest of the state combined. So just well, for the record, good just things for, in Wisconsin, yeah, Senator Baldwin. Just, just for the, the record, you let, don't realize that. Please, just for the record, um, I, I wonder, uh, based on what I'm hearing, you're saying that if uh, Social Security uh, were being looked at down the road, that I don't hear anybody saying they would favor raising the age of, of eligibility for Social Security or means testing for Social Security or changing the cap on income for Social Security. Do, do you agree with any of those things or is that off the table? Um, I, I'd be Briefly from each of you. Okay, briefly, the, the last time uh, we uh, made some major changes was when Reagan put together a bipartisan commission and gave Congress an up or down vote. Uh, we could do it that way again. But listen, at a time when pensions are in jeopardy, people's retirement savings has been spent sending their kids to college and high medical expenses, that's the last time to weaken okay. something that Wisconsin, um, Wisconsin actually helped write. Right. Um, well, certainly people who are at or near retirement need to know that we are committed in following through on our promises. Beyond that, we have to have a national discussion. And you know what? Young people are already talking about it. When I travel to the college campuses, they don't trust what's going to be there for them when they get close to retirement age. So we need to have that national discussion. But let's talk about the things we've done in Wisconsin. You even just brought up pensions. We have a fully funded pension in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. It's one of the only states. And it's because of responsible governing by people who understand economic uh, principles. We had a 9.3% unemployment rate in 2011, and now it is less than 3%. It's 2.7% below 3% for eight months. We had a $3.6 billion budget deficit in 2011, and now we have surpluses. This is the type of leadership you need in Washington, people who understand what works, right. and they're going to follow through and get it done in Washington. Uh, That's why I'm running. Again, brief, and we're going to move on to another topic, yes. You know, when I listen to employers across the state of Wisconsin, they're talking uh, about the fact that there's a skills gap. And we know we have people who want to work. Um, so the macro economy, those numbers are good, but people are struggling at the grassroots, whether it's in ag or manufacturing or elsewhere. On that skills gap, I think that we absolutely need to expand opportunities like uh, apprenticeships. My Partners Act would do that in significant ways so the people could actually earn while they learn, not necessarily just go into debt as they build up the skills. We need to do this quickly and we need to focus on people who want to work but haven't been given that opportunity in life. I want to we agree ask on you, that because we've done that here in Wisconsin. It's very important that we have those apprenticeship programs. I want to ask you a question about uh, something. You, you were talking, Senator Hoopmeyer, about what you hear from younger people out there. One of the things you hear from younger folks is I've got student loan debt. Uh, I need some help with that. What's the proper role of a U.S. Senator in addressing the student loan debt issue? Get the government out of the business of providing loans. It's been absolutely abominable what has happened to our students. And we need to get that, get the government out of the way. Refinancing, create, would you favor need, refinancing the way uh, businesses to, do or uh, individuals do? We need to just get the government out of the business of loans and we need to continue to grow the economy so our kids have jobs when they're graduating, jobs that are good, well-paying jobs. Right now what has happened is just it's awful. What, what has happened now is actually you're incentivizing universities just to increase their tuitions. We in Wisconsin have been committed to taking care of our college kids and that's why we have frozen tuition for the last seven, eight years. But it's really important that, you know, this is a, another example where we're so different. Senator Bowen always believes that government has a solution. The federal government is not and should not be in the business of loan business. All right. Senator? First of all, it's a vital issue, and um, you know, young children who see their older siblings go deep into debt for a higher education are rethinking of whether they should even do what their families and society has told them to do. You know, I don't think the problem with uh, the student debt is uh, government. I think it's Wall Street. I think that they have an interest in keeping that law that says that students can't renegotiate to lower interest rates. You know, you can re refinance a car, you can refinance your home, but students with, or graduates with mountains of debt can't do that. We have to be willing to stand up to those interests, the big banks. We have to be willing to stand up and fight on behalf 
of whether it's students, seniors, people who have pre-existing health conditions. Um, but we can't be, we can't have leaders who are beholden to the special interests. Right. Okay, I need to make, respond to this whole special interest notion because that's all we hear. It's the only thing I hear coming out of Senator Bowen. I would love to hear her talk about what she stands for. Instead, all she does is attack me on one thing after another. I said it before, Senator Bowen, you've received $26 million in special interest money, $600,000 from groups and organizations that benefit from the Affordable Care Act. You've received $750,000 from Planned Parenthood, the largest provider of abortions in the country. 17 of your former aides have gone on to become lobbyists in Washington, D.C., and they've encouraged you, they've lobbied you to sign on to 127 of their bills. Yes. Check out the facts. But Senator Bowen, and to say that I, as a middle class mom who got into politics just because I was concerned about my daughter's education, that I am in the back pocket of special interests, it's laughable. Well, and while you're talking about well, this me. organization, Alec, I have to get a word in about that. So I belong to an organization that believes that government closest to the people is best to make decisions. Imagine that. Our founding fathers thought that. And Senator Baldwin, last time I checked, you didn't send back the money that you received from some of the same groups that sponsor ALEC. Senator Baldwin. Just saying. Um, well, I'm proud to say uh, that my average online contribution is $19, and some of the very special interests who have contributed to my campaign are people like Tara and Jenny and so many others who have told me their, um, their stories about fearing for a loved one um, who won't be able to get health insurance um, because they have a pre-existing condition. Um, this is a, a real ironic statement after we have seen over 14 million dollars of super PAC secretive spending launched against me from before uh, I even had an opponent. Uh, nobody had even announced in the spring of 2017 uh, that they were thinking of or were going to run for Senate. But most viewers who watch television have seen those attack ads. Those are funded by powerful special interests to the extent that we can actually see who they're funded by because there's a lot of dark and money and secret money. Well, but the the, the yeah. Koch Brothers Network, Richard Uline, uh, the names go on. Those folks have an agenda, and they want a senator who is going to do their bidding. Otherwise, why would they spend $14 million trying to attack me? I will always fight for Wisconsinites, and I will stand up to those interests at every turn. We're going to move on to a, a, There are another, no promises that were made we're to the $26 million. To, <laughs> we're going to move on to another <laughs> topic here. Um, uh, Okay. Do you need a nurse? <laughs> I got, I'm right here. I, I got the. Uh, uh, that's a nice moment of levity. I like that. Yes. Yeah. I'm um, here for you. So let's talk about uh, immigration for a moment. Uh, I, I noticed something that was said by the Secretary of State today, Mike Pompeo, this afternoon. He said that the U.S. is reaching, and I'm quoting him now, a moment of crisis because of the record number of migrants spilling into the country. Uh, Senator Vukmir, is it a moment of crisis? Is immigration in this country a moment of crisis? At a moment of crisis. I'm the daughter of Greek immigrants. So right. my childhood was spent watching my aunts and uncles come to this country. My dad came here from Greece in 54, and people went through a process to become legal citizens. What's happening right now at the border is chaos. And it's chaos that <coughs> Senator Baldwin is more than happy to uh, go along with. It's as if our borders are ali ali oxen free. Anyone can come in. We've heard that it's close to 4,000 people now that are coming close to the border. And they all know those three words I want asylum. Senator Baldwin hasn't been willing to work on changing the rules. And right now, what ends up happening, because they know those three words, every Tom, Dick, and Harry who wants to get across that border gets across the border. And unfortunately, our border security, they're overwhelmed. And so what are they doing? They're trying to process people as best as they can, and, and they let them go. It's a catch and release You agree program. That, that we're in a moment of crisis. Yes, you agree with that is. description. And we need to have people who yeah. are willing to stand with the president right. in sealing that border once and for all. Senator, Senator Baldwin. Baldwin wants open borders. Well, that's nonsense, and Leah is clearly lying again. But here is Please. 
here is, when I first came to the United States Senate, Democrats and Republicans worked together to uh, craft a bipartisan, comprehensive immigration reform bill. It dealt with border security. It had 20,000 new border agents uh, assigned to the uh, southern border. It dealt with a pathway to citizenship for dreamers and others. It also dealt with some uh, things that we're really concerned about here in Wisconsin where agricultural visas don't meet the needs of most of our farmers if we're the dairy state. It just so happens that uh, cows need to be milked uh, every day and most agricultural visa programs uh, are for the planting and harvest season. So it, it's very clear that our current system is broken and it needs fixing. I voted for that bill. It passed with 68 votes in the United States Senate, and unfortunately the House didn't uh, bring it up. But I, uh, my opponent uh, wants more of a political uh, issue to run on rather than real solutions. And other than saying that she will build a wall and do nothing else until that wall is built, I have heard nothing to solve this problem from my opponent. I want to ask each of you a very uh, basic question. What do we do with the thousands of undocumented people who are in the state of Wisconsin right now? What should happen to them? Senator Rupert? Well, first, yes, I do believe in building the wall. And once we have that wall and that commitment, then we can look at taking care of the DACA children. You know, nobody wants them to not have a pathway to citizenship, but we have to have the commitment first. Right now, people are taking advantage of our porous walls, and it is not just an issue issue of illegal immigrants coming across the border. It's gang members, gang members, uh, MS-13 members, human drug trafficking. It's a public health risk. The border communities are dealing with public health issues. I key into that because I'm a nurse. So Senator Baldwin prefers this chaos. She had an opportunity what do we when, do with when the, the president in the state of what, Wisconsin who are undocumented. Well, as I said, we first have to make sure that we have the commitment that we build the wall and then those individuals need to go through a process, a, a pathway to citizenship. But it's not just a wave of the wand. Senator People Wood. should not just have the privilege of coming into this country and taking advantage of all that this great country has without going through the process as so many others have and are currently going through in order to become legal citizens. Mm -hmm. Senator, Senator uh, Baldwin wants to throw that all out. What, what do we have to do, or do we do anything, uh, with the people who are in this state, in this country, illegally? Well, the comprehensive immigration reform bill that I described, that I voted for in 2013, you think that's had an the answer. answer. Um, well, I would tell you that, uh, like many things in politics, it was a compromise. And there were provisions that I didn't like, and there were provisions that I thought very uh, strongly about. But that's how this system works. And you can't just simply dig in your heels and say, we're not talking about these things until however long it takes to do one thing. I did want to add, because of uh, it, uh, my opponent's uh, reference, especially to drug trafficking, um, you know, we do have an opioid epidemic and um, a drug abuse epidemic in this country and in this state. Um, there's a drug called fentanyl, which is about 100 times more powerful than heroin. A lot of that is coming through a different port of entry. Uh, it's coming through our international mail facilities because the manufacturers in China are simply mailing it in. And that's why I was proud to work across party aisles to uh, raise enforcement at that port of entry in the United States, and hopefully the President will sign the Opioid Response Act of 2018 uh, legislation into law this week. I want to talk a, a little foreign policy here, and I'm going to ask both of you if we can kind of keep the, the answers as, as tight as possible, get as much ground covered as possible. Um, so um, we have the death of uh, Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, he is a, a journalist who's been critical of the Saudi uh, uh, royal family. Uh, he uh, wrote for the Washington Post. He was a resident of the United States, not a citizen, but a resident of the United States. And, and this evening, the Saudi government said uh, that he died during a fight inside the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. Uh, Turkish sources uh, say otherwise. They say he was murdered and then dismembered. Uh, as members of the U.S. Senate, uh, what is the proper response? Do you think there should be serious sanctions against Saudi Arabia based on what we know about this incident so far? Senator Baldwin, I'll begin with you. Absolutely. Uh, and what does serious and, mean in your well, mind? 
Um, serious uh, would be parallel to uh, two of the measures that I voted on uh, earlier this year, which is to stop uh, our arms sales, especially munitions and uh, aircraft, uh, uh, that are going on if we don't vote to stop them. Um, so the hundred and ten billion dollars. I started, by the way. Students. I want to say before. I mean, th this um, what we're what we're learning about uh, Khashoggi's death is horrifying. But I believe that we should be cracking down on Saudi Arabia because of their involvement in a proxy war in Yemen. And what didn't get reported on very much, although we did see some was uh, the Saudi Arabians uh, bombing a school bus and killing 40 children. Um, this is something we have to stop, step up against. And so it's not just this, but certainly we should ramp up uh, from there and cancel these uh, munitions deals that are, uh, you know, that are out there. Senator Buchner? Well, it's barbaric. And it's just horrible to think that anyone would do uh, what was done there and the president wants to make sure that he has all the information before he makes a decision on sanctions and if indeed we know and we know who has done exactly what has uh, been alleged then yes we must have sanctions I agree with the, the senator on that. Arms deals that, uh, that uh, are I'm, pending right I'm now? I'm going to trust the president on when, based on the information that he has you know it's a complex region of the world we have to understand that we have to balance our concerns for humanitarian needs uh, along with our concerns for creating peace and stability in a region of the world that is very, very difficult. And I think it's important that uh, we give the president time to get to the bottom of what happened, to talk to his advisors and people that uh, he surrounds himself with, and, and then make decisions moving forward. I would only say the president's position has evolved throughout the week. First, he said he'd wait for the Saudi Arabian investigation to conclude. At least now he's listening to his own intelligence advisors and military advisors and has now at least concluded. Uh, I mean, it's just unbelievable to me uh, that he would accept Saudi Arabia's word for what might have happened in Turkey. Let's talk about Afghanistan for a moment. So American troops have been in Afghanistan for 17 years now. Um, this past week we saw an attack uh, where the U.S. commander narrowly escaped, uh, General Miller narrowly escaped, the Kandahar uh, police chief in Afghanistan was murdered. Uh, how long do we keep troops in Afghanistan? Senator Bukmir? The war in Afghanistan was not an optional war. 3,000 Americans were killed on our soil by a plot that was planned by evil forces in Afghanistan. I have a son in the military, so you gotta know that this issue is very central to how I look at the world. And I think it's really important that we make decisions based on where those threats to our national security are. If there are safe havens, places where terrorists are training, planning, and plotting, then it is in our national security interest to make sure that we maintain a presence. And that applies to Afghanistan or anywhere else. We have to root out those safe havens. And these people are extreme. They want to take down the ideals of this great country. And, and so we have to be very careful moving forward that once we know, for example, Syria is another area, once we know that we have uh, taken care of these safe havens, then we need to allow regional powers to come in and stabilize. But again, yeah. not an optional war. We had a reason to be there. Senator Baldwin, how long do we keep troops in Afghanistan? Um, I was serving in the House of Representatives during 9-11. I voted to uh, authorize use of force in Afghanistan. I voted uh, uh, for a very clear mission. Um, and that was a narrow mission to go after those who uh, were the architects of the 9-11 attacks and anyone who offered them safe haven. This is not year two of the war in Afghanistan. This is the beginning of year 18. And I cannot imagine anything that we're going to be doing differently in year 18 
that justifies uh, keeping our troops there. I believe Pull our troops, the troops. I believe our troops should come home because Afghans must take control of their own future. Even if they're still this training mission, people there, I, that's. 12 years of training should have caught up. I have a son in the military. Maybe because have. you don't have a child in the military, you don't look at it the same way as I do. Go ahead and finish your point. Um, I have great respect for those who serve our nation. I also have great respect for the need to uh, have a clear mission and to stick to that. And I think our troops in Afghanistan, Afghanistan should come home. I want to ask you a question about NATO, uh, President Trump. For now, we're in NATO. President Trump has expressed some concern about NATO over the last few months. Uh, he even has hinted that he, the, the withdrawal of the U.S. from NATO might have been on the table for at least a while. Uh, so my question is this. Should the U.S. Senate have to approve any U.S. withdrawal from NATO? Should there be a two-thirds vote, for instance, Senator Baldwin? Absolutely. I uh, I think especially in light of a time when uh, a, international agreements um, have been ripped up or disregarded by uh, this president, I think about in particular what sort of message this uh, sends to uh, you know, our President Putin, who's watching uh, the President of the United States uh, get out of the Paris Accord, get out of the Iranian nuclear deal, walk away from other uh, international um, alliances, or at least uh, uh, condemn them verbally. Um, we keep our word, and part of the reason why um, the United States has great world influence is for doing so. Now, that said, the only time Article 5 of the NATO agreement has ever been invoked was by the United States after 9-11. And our international allies came to our side. We must respect that. And I don't think uh, that the president should be able to do anything of the sort unilaterally. I, I think that the president, I, I'm pleased that the president has stepped up, put on pressure, said, look, we all have to do our fair share. This is part of his pattern, which is very refreshing. And as I talk to people all across the state, this president is standing up to foreign leaders. He is not bowing to them literally and figuratively as the previous president did. And I hear Senator Baldwin talk about these international agreements. You have voted against dozens of these trade agreements against various countries, against two continents. You are all over the map when it comes to talking about tariffs. You know, you criticized the original, um, uh, the original deals with Mexico and uh, and Canada, and then as our president as was president. Negotia as the as the president negotiated them, you were criticizing him. Your s website says that you were part of the NAFTA renegotiations, you're all yeah. over the map. And I think it's really important that we understand where you stand because you say you stand with farmers. You say where you stand with farmers, and yet you have voted right. against these deals that well, give them access to other markets. I, we're going to run out of time here, and I want to try to make the most of this time. Um, so uh, to finalize this, uh, you think the Senate should uh, have the ability to uh, weigh in on whether the president would want to take us out of NATO? I think things have been working out just fine. I'm glad that the president is standing okay. up and on behalf. He's okay. always put America first. All right, and give you a chance to respond to, to that, and then we're going to move on again. So go well, ahead. Well, just to, to uh, Leah Bukmir's comments, I have been a long critic of NAFTA. It uh, has not uh, done well by our manufacturing economy here in Wisconsin. We have lost too many jobs. And I agreed with the president when he said we should renegotiate it. When I claim involvement, it's frequent communication with Secretary Sonny Perdue, the USDA, uh, on behalf of our dairy farmers, communication with Lighthizer, our US trade representatives, about issues with uh, Canada and dairy, and certainly frequent uh, discussions with Secretary Ross about 
Buy America and the procurement sections. Um, I believe that the New Deal uh, that's being proposed is an improvement, but I have not finished studying it, and I um, believe that some of the provisions won't be enforceable, so I want to see it improved. Our farmers seconds. do need access yes, to do. more markets, yes, and they do. you're all over the map. Yeah. In fact, what you're doing is you're <laughs> sounding like Chicken Little and saying that the sky is falling, and you're giving this um, China the sense that we're not going to deal, and that is going to hurt our farmers. That is going to yeah. hurt them because China is already crumbling. Their GDP is already um, lowering, and it's showing that what the president is doing is actually working. I'm going to uh, move on to uh, another topic, and, and this is something that's been uh, sort of front and center in this campaign. Senator Bookmere, you've been very critical of Senator Baldwin and how her office handled the uh, opioid crisis at the Toma VA, uh, the overprescription of opioids to veterans who were there. Uh, you've run a couple of ads on this topic, and one of them you say, uh, and I'm quoting now, I've spent my life helping patients. Uh, directing your comments to, to Senator Baldwin, you said, you've spent yours playing politics and it costs veterans their lives. I just want to be sure that's a, a serious statement. I want to be sure I'm interpreting that correctly. Um, are you saying that Senator Baldwin or members of her staff were somehow responsible for the deaths of uh, veterans at the Tacoma VA? My word is my word. Senator Baldwin turned that into a political situation. Senator Baldwin had information for eight months and she sat on it. There was a veteran at the Toma VA who was trying so hard to get the word out. Senator Baldwin hires Hillary Clinton's attorneys, and then she goes and offers hush money, taxpayer-funded hush money, Those to one lies. of her employees. It's true, Senator. Those are lies. Read the ethics complaint. It is true. That she was offers dismissed without merit. Fo yes, yeah. A so fox get guarding, many fox times, guarding, right? fox guarding the hen house. Read that report. It is absolutely will take your breath away. So, okay. Senator Baldwin. You're the one who's playing politics. You sent out a letter to every registered voter talking about what happened at Toma. That's not political. Let's, let's uh, give her a chance to respond. We're, again, we're trying to manage the time, so go ahead and respond. Well, first of all, I almost, if not all, every sentence she just uttered is uh, is totally untruthful. But I also believe that Leah Buchner should be ashamed of using uh, the death of a Marine veteran for her own political gain. Uh, this is outrageous to me. Um, when I found out about what was happening at the Toma VA and also found out that it was happening throughout the VA system, I worked with the family of Jason Simkowski, with his parents, with his widow, and his daughter, to write strong legislation in Jason's name as a memorial to his legacy to totally transform the opioid prescribing in the VA. And let me tell you that when that legislation passed and was signed into law and has been implemented, it is working. At Toma, 47% fewer veterans are being prescribed chronic opioids. Yeah. And 74% fewer are being uh, prescribed the dangerous <laughs> uh, interactive uh, benzodiazepines and right. opioids. It's working. I try to fix problems, and we shouldn't be playing politics one, with our veterans who have earned and deserved the care that they get. One more question for each of you on this topic. Senator Baldwin, uh, you have conceded in interviews, one that I did with you, that mistakes were made. Mistakes mm -hmm. in communication, mistakes in judgment, mistakes yes. in how quickly your office responded to these concerns. Why is that not a valid issue in this race? Why should people be ashamed of raising this as an issue? Well. For, certainly, I owned up and said there were mistakes in communication, um, and I After fixed them. Months. I fixed them. That is not true, um, and and I address them, and I prove myself every day by fighting for and veterans, and also having the sort of legislative and other response to these problems. Um, Veterans in Wisconsin know I fight for them. Senator Vukmir, I've only got about 45 seconds left. This is the question, though. Uh, Jason Simkuski, the Marine who died, his family, his parents, uh, were in an ad, and his dad said, um, you know, every time I hear them attacking uh, Senator Baldwin, I just want to say stop. You say you're a military mom, he's a military dad. Why not listen to the military dad? They are to be commended for forgiving Senator Baldwin for dropping the ball on the veterans. It was more than Jason Simkowski. There were so many other veterans that were affected. 
there were drugs leaching out into the community at a time when we have a serious heroin and opioid addiction problem, to think that you had such careless disregard and could not be accountable to our veterans, how can we expect you to be accountable to the rest of the residents of the state of Wisconsin? It's wrong. I stand by it. And she dropped the ball. And it would have been far better to have admitted it right away and moved on. But now you have made it political. By, by doing all the things that you have done since then, and shame on you. 15 seconds, and this is the end of the discussion on this topic, yes. Well, I got results by working with a family who decided bravely to turn their tragedy into hope for other veterans, and that's exactly what it's doing. Worked with the DAV, the VFW, Democrats and Republicans alike in the United States Congress. That's not playing politics, that's getting results for our veterans. Let me uh, uh, wrap things, this part of our evening up right here, and we're going to go to closing statements now. Um, we flipped a coin to determine the order, and we're going to begin with Senator Bukmir. So take a gulp of water and, <laughs> and get ready. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mike. The contrast could not be more clear, and it boils down to trust. Who will you trust on health care? The career politician who has spent her life walking in the halls of government, or the career nurse who has spent my life walking in the halls of great hospitals in our state? Who will you trust on immigration reform? The senator who supports open borders and sanctuary cities, or the daughter of Greek immigrants who believes we are a nation of laws that must be upheld? Who will you support on taxes? Senator Baldwin? who believes and has supported 413 different tax in increases, or the mom with the cause who has overseen $8 billion in tax relief to the people of Wisconsin. And who will you trust for our veterans? Senator Baldwin or myself who has always had their backs. I've spent my life caring for my patients in need and families. I have taken, made a difference in their lives I want to take that same passion to Washington, and I am asking for your vote on November 6th. Senator Bookmere, thank you. And now let's hear from Senator Baldwin. Senator. Well, thank you. I want to thank you, Mike Goucher, our hosts, our viewers tonight. You know, I also want to thank Leah for agreeing to debate, because I think these three debates have shown very clearly the stark and clear contrast between the two of us. Perhaps no sharper distinction than the tax legislation that Leah Vukmir has uh, supported that gives 83% of its benefits to the top richest 1% and big corporations. Those who, um, uh, if it had been the other way around, I would have supported it. But now those who supported the tax bill are looking at cutting earned benefits like Social Security and Medicare in order to cover the $2 trillion cost. Look, I am unafraid to stand up to Wall Street, multinational corporations, big insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies. I want to continue to fight for Wisconsinites. I hope you will give me that opportunity. It's an honor, and I ask for your vote. Senator Baldwin, thank you. Senator Vukmir, thanks thank you, to you. And uh, again, thanks to everybody here at the law school tonight for their attendance and everyone at home for watching. This debate has been a production of WISN 12 News and Marquette University Law School. The election is Tuesday, November 6th, and we encourage everyone to get out and vote. Have a wonderful night and go Brewers. <laughs>